Good morning, everybody. For those of you who are uh, decreasingly or increasingly few that don't know me, I am Jamie, friend of Dale, (laughs) and uh, elder at Covenant Community Church in Lake Butler. And uh, just, I am so glad to be here. I love you guys so much. I love Dale and Amber so much and his family. And we just, we just always love to be here. So uh, let's go to Psalm 2. Are we, are we reading it on the screen like we did last time? Or are we doing something different? All right, so we'll, uh, we'll read it together. Oh, all right. <laughs> Upgrade. All right, so let's, uh, let's read it together, and I'll try to do it at a pace where we all can, can do it. You ready? Why do the nations rage... And the peoples plot in vain. The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. God's King reigns. Amen? Amen. So I think that's an appropriate title for... Uh, the sermon today. How many folks do I have in here that um, grew up going to church and going to Sunday school? Wow. Most everyone, or a lot, a lot of folks. How many grew up going to a Pentecostal Sunday school? Less folks. <laughs> but I did. But we may have this, uh, we may have this in uh, common uh, is... When the teacher asks a question in Sunday school, what's the default answer? Jesus, Jesus right? That's what everybody says. Uh, whatever the, whatever the, the answer, is, or whatever the question is, the answer is Jesus. And I, th- I thought of that when I was studying the, uh, this text for the sermon today. The default meaning, what, where our brain immediately goes, is Jesus, right? When we read Psalm 2, that's, that is the default meaning. That is immediately where our brain goes because a psalm like this one is just obviously messianic and it is inundated with those messianic imp- implications. But I think when we read a text like this, that's that way it is, it's easy to skip right to the messianic meaning and, uh, and miss... Uh, something uh, important about the entire meaning of the text. And so it was a temptation for me to do so in the preparation for the sermon, will be a temptation for me to do so while I preach this. And I do think that the messianic meaning of the text is the ultimate meaning. uh, And I do not believe that it can be separated from uh, the, uh, the immediate context. But but I think that if we skip it, we run the risk of losing some of those important details that I just mentioned of that ultimate messianic meaning. And you know how it is with studying Scripture. For those of you that spend time studying your Bibles, you know that uh, you have to uncover what it meant so you can discover what it means, right? That's one of the basic, just kind of fundamental principles of studying the Bible. And so here's what I want to do for the sermon today. Uh, I want us to uh, move through the text and just see how the psalm speaks immediately, how it speaks to the immediate uh, 
audience about the Davidic reign. And then I want us to look at uh, the way that Psalm 2 speaks down through the ages, how we immediately understand, or how we understand it rather in its messianic context, its messianic meaning. And then I think that Psalm 1 and 2 relate to each other, and I think the way that they relate to each other tells us something about the entire story of God's, redempti- of God's uh, redemption, uh, which is what the Bible is all about. And so I, want to, I don't want to get out of here without looking at that before, uh, before we close. So first, let's look at the immediate meaning. And we see, first of all, the nation's foolish response to the rule of God. And uh, so if I, if I came up to you, and it looked like, especially in uh, my head region, that I'd gotten into a swarm of bees, and you asked, uh, and you asked me, dude, what happened to your face? Uh, and I told you, well, I challenged Floyd Mayweather, uh, uh, Floyd Mayweather to a boxing match. You would probably lead with a question to show me how stupid I was for doing that, right? <laughs> you challenged Floyd Mayweather to a boxing match? I mean, you know, some of us think Conor McGregor was stupid for doing it. Uh, and it would be especially dumb for me to do that. And you would say, why would you do that? Are you crazy? Are you insane? Why would you think that you could be a match for him? Why, to the detriment of your face, would you plot in vain? <laughs> right? Why, why, why would you do that? And I think that that's uh, something similar to what's happening here in, in uh, verse 1. Why do the nations rage why do the peoples plot in vain and so this is God's covenant people singing this song um, and uh, and their voices heard first and they are singing asking this question about how foolish it is for foreign kings and nations to plot against the rule of Israel as if they could do anything about their plight this is this is dumb why would you do that So apparently some of the Gentile kings that are being alluded to here uh, were conquered by David and they were under the rule of Israel and along with their subjects, they were planning a revolt of some sort to shake off Israelite rule. They are consulting together. They are surmising how they may be able to break the yoke of bondage or to cast off the cords of servitude, as the scripture says, to Israel. And and it's, it's... ultimate vanity and it's worthless raging for them to do such kind of like me fighting Floyd Mayweather right I mean it's it's just vain what do you expect what do you expect to happen why are you doing this and then we see God's response we uh, we see what he does in verse 4 and also begin to see the folly of a little more the folly of the thing when it talks about the Lord's response. God thinks it's, a, it's as absurd as his covenant people are thinking about in this song. The Bible says the Lord laughs, right? He, he holds them in derision. There's, one, there's a term that we use all the time. He holds them in derision. What does that mean? And it implies here that in the Hebrew that they are being made fun of, like in, uh, imitating a foreigner uh, or speaking unintelligibly, and th- in this context, probably to overemphasize their, their accent. And so there's some artistic or poetic license being used to show the, the vanity of, or the folly of their counsel and attempted coup. So... The Lord is holding them in derision. He's making fun of them almost, at least in the, uh, uh, for the purpose of the psalm here. And so going back to my Floyd Mayweather uh, beating me up illustration, if he fattened my lip while uh, I plotted in vain to fight him and to emphasize how dumb I was to do that, you started talking like me with a fat lip, right? Oh, yeah, that was real smart you know, type thing. And, uh, and th- so that's kind of <laughs> what's being communicated, at least as, as it uh, works out in, in my brain. So 
He is holding them in derision. This is just, it's, it's folly. It's unthinkable that you would do that. The Lord's up here laughing. He is scoffing at you or making fun of you for thinking that you could shake off uh, Israelite rule. And you may be sitting here thinking, well, if I were a king and I were, was under uh, an oppressive rule, I'd try to be figuring out uh, how to get out from under that oppression. You know, what's so, what's so dumb about that? But verse 2 tells us that it is so vain and outrageous to plot and consult and to do what they're doing because they are not just setting themselves against any old king. They're setting themselves against Jehovah's anointed king. This king is Jehovah's anointed. And so when they set themselves against the Lord's king, what they are actually doing is they are setting themselves against Jehovah himself, right? Uh, the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. And so it's foolish because you are plotting against God himself. What are you going to do about that? That is an incredibly foolish thing to do. It's foolish because they can't do anything about it. It's foolish because of their absolute helplessness to fight against God and his anointed king. But there's another reason it's foolish. And that's, in, uh, that's actually found in verse 12. It's because everyone that takes refuge in this king is actually blessed because of it. Blessed to do it and blessed by it. And so they are doing something foolish because it's not going to work anyway. But then even if it did work, even if you waged a battle against God and you won, you would be doing it to your own detriment because you would be rebelling against the good and gracious rule of God through his chosen king. So it's foolish for you to do that. You are plotting in vain. You are taking counsel together in folly. The next voice that we hear in this psalm in verse 5 and 6 is God's voice. And he responds and then really gives evidence to the people's claim that their king is Jehovah's anointed king. Look at, look at verse 5. He speaks in wrath. Then he will speak in wrath. Now the uh, verse previous says that, he, that God is laughing. And I don't know if you know this or not, but typically when God laughs, it ain't funny, right? And it ain't funny here, but it is terrifying. It is, uh, it is causing them to shake in their boots when the Lord speaks in his wrath and terrifies them in his fury. God says he has established his king in Zion. This dynasty that they are trying to shake off, or they are trying to war against, came about by the sovereign appointment of the Almighty God of heaven. And it came about in the place that He sovereignly ordained, Zion. The psalmist says, uh, His holy hill. He has divinely established the rule of His anointed King in the place that He is divinely appointed, and he is angry that anyone would dare challenge that sovereign decree. And then the next voice that we hear in verse 7 through 9 is the voice of Jehovah's anointed king. And he declares that it is indeed Jehovah who has established his rule. I will tell of the decree the Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make your nations, or make the nations your heritage and the end of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. This is what the Lord had said. And this is, he's not just making this up for dramatic effect to accompany God's terrifying speaking. But David, as God's chosen king, is actually what was spoken by the oracle of God concerning the Davidic dynasty in uh, 2 Samuel, verse 7 through 14. So I want to read that to you. 
I'm sorry, 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 14 through 16. I will, be, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. But my steadfast love will not depart from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. And so... 2 Samuel 7, 14 through 16 is the oracle of God. And remember, this is God's people singing about this. And, and it's talking about uh, a son that would come. And the Davidic lineage would ultimately be forever and ever. But we're hearing about... And this is where it's hard for me to stay off of the messianic meaning. I'll get to it in a moment. But, but we're hearing here, though, about a son whose kingdom would be forever. And we know that Solomon didn't ultimately realize that, right? And so something, something's going on here, but this is the anointed king's response. But, but at any rate, for now, what I want us to see is that the anointed king speaks about two things that God has done. The Lord establishes his rule over all nations. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession and immediately it speaks about the universality of the davidic dynasty he will rule over all the land god has promised right and so we see that uh, realized in david and then expanded even in uh, with solomon and this is also a, a fulfillment though not an ultimate and complete fulfillment of the promise to abraham that all the nations of the earth would be blessed through him. And that's what the Lord, that's what the Lord speaks or the Lord promises to this anointed king that he his rule will be universal and particularly to the Davidic dynasty over all the land that God had promised. And then the second thing that uh, God will do through this anointed king is he will judge the nations. So all the nations who rebel against this rule particularly speaking to the nations that are plotting in vain here, are going to be crushed under the righteous rule. He will crush them with a rod of iron. He will break them in pieces like a clay vessel. And that's, what, that's what's being said by the anointed king in response to these foolish plotters. And then we see the appropriate response, right? So you see the, the wrong response at the beginning but then the, at the end of the psalm, you see the appropriate response. We've heard what the rebel rulers had to say. We uh, heard what God had to say. We heard what his anointed king had to say. And now the song commences with what wisdom tells us we should do, how we should respond or how everyone should respond. And it, and it comes in light of what has been said about God establishing his anointed as king. And I'm not sure whose voice is speaking here, but it could be all the voices. It could be the king still speaking. It could be Jehovah speaking. It could be all the voices of God's covenant people as they sing this song. Not sure. Remember, this is a song. But at any rate, the wise counsel that the scripture gives us is to submit to the rule of the Lord's anointed before he come, becomes angry and pours out his wrath on them. And I, I, love, I love this phrase, kiss the sun. That's an interesting phrase, isn't it? And in, in verse 12, it says, kiss the sun, lest he be angry with you and you perish in the way. The NASB has it, do homage, which does capture the essence of what is being said by kiss the sun, but it's not as poetic, right, as kiss the sun. That, that sounds a little more poetic. And I think the idea could probably translate in our mind like, Kiss the king's ring, right? Acknowledge his rulership and his authority, or maybe even bow down and, and kiss his feet. Bow down before him and kiss the son, kiss his feet. Acknowledge his authority and rulership. And even in, in the Hebrew, uh, that phrase can be 
kind of is like turn in your weapons. It, it can be calling for a disarmament of the dissenting rulers. Cast down your weapons. Kiss his ring. Bow down and kiss his feet. Kiss the son, lest he be angry with, with you. And to say that it is a disarmament would also make sense in light of what the rest of the psalm is talking about, uh, considering the foreign king's foolish plotting and raging. Why are you, why are you doing this? You're not going to be able to do anything about it. This is the Lord's king, right? You're fighting against God. Just bow down. Just submit to his rulership. Turn in your weapons. And then the psalm finally closes with the reason it is wise to submit to the rule of God's king. And I've alluded to it already. It is wise because all who flee to him for refuge are blessed and safe. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Bow down, and in that you will find blessing. And I think you can see the contrast here, which is a poetic device, which was also used in Psalm 1. I'm sure that, that, was, uh, that you saw that last week, uh, seeing the contrast here as well. The folly of rebellion of the foreign kings is contrasted by the wisdom of submitting to the rule of God's anointed king. The jeopardy their rebellion causes them is contrasted by the refuge and safety they find in submitting to his rule and trusting his righteous reign. There's even a chiastic structure in Psalm 2. Uh, I, could, I think that I could point out at least a simple one to you, but I am preaching. I'm not writing a paper, so we won't go into all that. But um, let's also uh, let's move on then from... Uh, that immediate meaning, and let's look at the messianic meaning. And so I think, it's, I think it's obvious that there is a messianic meaning, don't you? As a matter of fact, it was so overwhelming that I felt like I needed to justify the reason that I didn't lead with that messianic uh, meaning at the, at the very beginning. But we look at that, uh, we look at the passage and we note verse 2, right, has anointed, capitalized. Then we look down at verse 7 and, and see that son is also capitalized. And so at the very least, we know that this is, a, this is talking about a title, but maybe more. And it sparks our memory. And we look back at 2 Samuel. Remember, uh, just a moment ago, I read 2 Samuel uh, 7, 14 through 16. And there, when it was talking about the son, it wasn't talking about a title. It, and it was, uh, it was certainly not capitalized. It was actually talking about... Uh, Solomon. And now some of you keen um, Bible studiers and Bible readers know that verse 7 rings a bell. Somewhere that appears in another place in Scripture. Anybody know where? Hebrews. Hebrews 1, 5. Let's, let's read it. Hebrews 1, 5. For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have, for, but I have, man, I am wanting to say forgotten so bad. I, never, I always say forgotten, never say begotten, and that's why. It's not because I'm a heretic. <laughs> God's anointed king is not God's forgotten son. It's God's begotten son. All right? So, uh, but, but anyway, uh, so, we, so, so uh, I lost my place there. We, we know that Psalm 2-7 is a reference uh, to the Davidic, di Davidic dynasty and that 2 Samuel 7 is speaking immediately about Solomon. So we know that there's more to it than the immediate meaning. There's obviously a messianic meaning and we get that. I think we get that. When we, when we read and study our Bibles even, that's kind of... One of the ways that we approach it, we are not asking, does this text speak about Jesus? We ask, how does this text speak about Jesus? How does this text speak about, uh, about Jesus? So considering the messianic meaning, I, that's, that's the question that I, that I want to ask and then answer at least, at least partially. How does Psalm 2 speak about Jesus? Jesus. 
And I think that it seems obvious that Jesus is God's anointed king. Psalm, I'm sorry, 2 Samuel uh, chapter 7 is referencing Solomon immediately. But we know that Solomon failed. That David failed. Solomon failed. Their descendants failed. We also know that Israel was actually divided and then ultimately lost her identity in Babylonian exile. So that means that the son of David must be a reference to another king in the Davidic lineage. And we know that that king is the Messiah. That is Jesus of Nazareth. He is the anointed one. The, the passage ultimately is talking about Jesus as God's anointed king. And I don't think anybody's surprised by that one. He is the begotten son and the anointed king. And God has established his rule through Jesus forever and ever. God's king reigns. The, he, God has uh, established his rule through his son. And it also shows us who over whom the anointed son reigns. And first, he reigns over those, well, over everybody. He reigns over those even who reject his rule. When men and women surmise in their plans to reject God's rule through his son Jesus, when the nations turn their backs on him and follow after idols and false gods, God's not like, oh man, what am, what am I doing? What's going to happen? I don't know how the world's going to turn out. No, God laughs, and it still ain't funny. Christ rules in righteousness and in judgment, and he will judge the people who turn their backs on him. Jehovah has given his anointed king, Jesus, his son, all rule and all dominion. Jesus said of himself just prior to the Great Commission, all authority in heaven and on earth is given to me. God's king is Jesus Christ, and all authority in heaven and on earth is given to him. Also, this, the rule of God's anointed son speaks to the all, already not yet reality of Christ's reign. You've probably heard folks talk about that. Christ rules over all, even now, right? But... We constantly see the, the nations raging and people plotting in vain. And I, don't, I want you to think about this. Does anybody here remember a time in their life when the nations were not raging and then the people were not plotting in vain? I think sometimes my generation looks at this nation and we're like, oh man, it's going to hell in a handbasket. What's going on here? Right? There has never been a time like this except... You know, 45 years ago, there was a time like this. And then I would say that 45 years before that, there was a time like that, right? The nations are constantly raging. The people are constantly plotting in vain. But Jesus reigns. It's always been that way. We all testify that the nations have always raged and the people are constantly rebelling but we also know because God's king reigns that vanity is all it amounts to. Foolishness is all that it is. He will, God's king will break the nations. He will judge the people who refuse to submit to him with an iron rod of judgment. So all the rage and chaos that we see around us, even that we feel immediately today, it's just, it's just vanity. It's ultimately meaningless because Jesus reigns and nothing or no one has or will ever escape his righteous judgment. Justice will be done. Second, and particularly, he reigns over all those who have wisely responded to his reign, they have fled to him for refuge. They have kissed the royal ring. They have disarmed themselves. 
and serve the king with fear and reverent rejoicing. There is no wrath or condemnation for them. They're not, they're not afraid of that iron rod. There is, there is a rod. He does rule over them and he does chasten them for their disobedience, but there is no condemnation and there is no fear of wrath. Rather, they have found, we have found, there is blessing and blessedness because kissing the sun is why we're created. That's, that's the reason we're here and that's where we find the most satisfaction. And I want us to take a sec to look at something that I've, I've mentioned a couple of times talking about God's wrath. Because I think it reveals something very important to us. Kiss the son lest he be angry with you and you perish in the way for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all those who take refuge in him. It gives a wise counsel to take refuge in the son whose wrath is quickly kindled, right? Kiss the son. Take refuge in him. You're blessed and safe in him. Oh, by the way, his wrath is quickly kindled. So the instruction is to flee from the wrath of the king, but the paradox is in that you flee to the wrath or flee to the king in fleeing from the wrath. If you're a refugee from a dictator, right, you don't flee to the king. You flee from the king. And this is the amazing truth about the gospel. That all of us, because of Adam's rebellion, he was created into the image of God, but as in his disobedience as the representative for humanity, he passed that rebellion down. And so he has put us all, we are all placed in verses 1 through 3. That's where we are. You want to, you want to find yourself in the scripture? We're... In verses 1 through 3, we are rebels against the rule of God. Scripture, human history, and even our lives prove that to be true. Very true, in fact. However, we can flee to the one we rebel against because of what God has done in the anointed Son in establishing His kingship. Listen, this king came to live among his subjects. And in so doing, he lived the life that was demanded by God. But the life that we didn't live because of our rebellious nature, because we are plotting in vain against him. But then on a Roman cross, he dies the way we should have died because he was actually taking the penalty of our rebellion in himself on our behalf. He bore God's wrath right, against our rebellion to prove that he was, in fact, God's anointed, appointed king and that he accomplished that work, that we're not just uh, speaking in vain here. Jesus Christ rose from the grave, and that's why we can flee to him from his wrath. It is because he has borne it in himself on our behalf. That is why in fleeing from the wrath of the king, we flee to the king. Because the king, on behalf of those that kiss his ring, has borne God's wrath against us. And so I want to say something to my unbelieving friend here today. Please, please, please flee to God's anointed king. Find refuge and blessing in Him. You won't find it anywhere else. And the other side of the coin is if you don't, this King will ultimately judge the unrighteous. And you will be judged with them. But I also want to say something to my Christian brothers and sisters today who may be struggling with assurance, who may be struggling with sin, or even some of you are like Dell, and you nail it day after day. I urge you to constantly flee to Christ. Constantly kiss the sun. You will find refuge there. So here's an apparent application. Kiss the sun, right? Rejoice in him. 
Serve him with all of your heart. That is where blessing is, and that is where refuge from the wrath of Jehovah is found. And ultimately, it's foolish to do anything else. Also, remember that this is a song sung by God's covenant people. They are singing this song, and in so, in so singing, they are calling for submission of the rebellious rulers and nations to submit to God's anointed king. And I think that that lays out a good example for us. We should follow suit. We should also be calling folks to submit to the rule of God's anointed king. To submit to the rule of God through His Holy Son, Jesus. As a matter of fact, that is the mission that this anointed king has left his followers with. A mission that is based in his all-encompassing authority in heaven and on earth. Right before he said, go and uh, disciple the nations, he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go. Go, therefore, and disciple the nations. And so we are calling everyone everywhere to submit to the reign of Jehovah's King and then to teach them to obey the command. So we disciple the nations by preaching the gospel, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and then teaching them to obey this King. And so that's what we need to be doing. And then one more point of application before I move on and close here. Those of us who have kissed the Son, who have submitted to His rule, should rest in His sovereign and righteous rule. I think, I think a lot of what is happening in our nation, and in our neighboring nations even, serve as a good illustration of what I'm trying to say. Look at, look at the unrest we see around us. Where is it coming from? I, I might argue that at least a good portion of it arises from a call for justice without God. People feel the need for what they believe to be justice to be enacted in the here and now. Even immediately, even before we know the whole situation, justice needs to be done right now. Without Jesus as their ruler, there's no real hope for justice, is there? And so they are raging over Every seeming offense, they are constantly plotting their own kind of justice. But we know that one day complete and true justice will reign forever and ever. And we can rest in that. But that just serves as an illustration, right? Because we can't point too many fingers. Because it might be over other things, but we tend to become anxious and unsettled, don't we? we? We tend to act like, even though we are saying amen to the sermon, we tend to act like that God's king doesn't reign. We become anxious and unsettled on a regular basis. How am I going to pay the bills? How am I going to take care of my aged mom? How am I going to be able to keep my convictions and my job at the same time? What will the world look like for my children and grandchildren? What are, going to, what are we going to do now that this administration is in office? Why, why can't I seem to balance my work and family life and I could stand up here for a long time and just give you a litany, a list, a long list of all of the things that we fret over and worry about. But we need to remember that our Savior, our Savior is God's anointed King. He is perfectly just and righteous and He reigns now. And will reign ultimately. He will return and fully consummate a just and righteous rule. God's king reigns. And he will reign forever and ever. So what does the psalm tell us to do? It tells us to serve him with rejoicing and trembling. So let's do that. One last thing, I do want to look briefly at the way Psalm 1 and 2 relate to each other because I think it brings into a little sharper, sharper focus the way Psalm 2 fits into the rest of the narrative of Scripture, which, as I've already mentioned, tells us the story of God's redemption. So Psalm 1 tells us that there are two types of people in the world, the righteous and the wicked. 
the righteous are obedient to God and they find life and blessing therein. But then the psalm contrasts the righteous with the wicked, and the wicked, on the other hand, are not obedient to God. That's how they are characterized. And they scoff even at those who are obedient to God. Their lives come to nothing, Psalm 1 tells us, and they perish along with their wicked ways. So ultimately, no one is righteous because everyone falls short of obedience to God. However, there is one who fulfills all righteousness and lives in perfect obedience, right? The ultimate blessed and righteous man of Psalm 1 is Jesus. And that same Jesus is the Davidic descendant that rules and reigns eternally. He is God's anointed king and he is perfectly just and righteous. He will ultimately judge the wicked and will pour out His wrath on all those who refuse to submit to Him. However, for those who have fled the righteous, those who have fled to Him for refuge, He has borne the wrath due to them. And this is how we are righteous. It's because He has declared us righteous by bearing the wrath of God in Himself against us. And they find refuge in Him. And we'll be safe when the wrath of God is poured out. That's how it dialogues. And it tells us the story, the gospel story, really, that no one lives in obedience, but Christ came and lived the life we should have lived and died the death we should have died. And all those who find refuge in Him will be safe from the wrath of God. So I just want you to be able to read Psalm 2 better. This was my aim. When you look back and, and think about or read Psalm 2 in the future, I want you to see that God has had a plan from the beginning to establish a kingdom of righteous people all over the world. And these people are not righteous because of their own obedience, but they are righteous because of the obedience of their king who lived and died in their stead. However, in fleeing to the king who has borne our sin and, and finding refuge there, we, his subjects are then compelled to live in obedience to Him. And we rest in the fact that He will return and ultimately consummate His righteous reign. We rest in that, even though we see that there is nothing but raging and chaos all around. So with that in view, we serve Him and rejoice in Him, and we confess to Him our sin when we fail. Isn't that something amazing? That we know how severe how severely God punishes sinners. We know how holy God is. But when we sin against God, what do we do? Ultimately, I know sometimes at first we sweep it under the rug and pretend like it's not there. But even, even when we prolong it and sweep it under the rug, those of us who are truly His, what do we ultimately do? We pull the rug back and we bring it before the God of wrath. And we say, hey God, God of wrath, I sinned against you, right? Why do we do that? It's because we, we have found refuge in this king. We have seen his nature. We know that he is a good and gracious king. We confess to him our sin when we fail. And then we anticipate the full revelation of this kingdom and know that it will come without fail. We are not even if we don't see the justice that we desire to see in this world, we know that it will come without fail because our king is God's king and God's king reigns forever. Let's pray. God, you are so good to us. Rebels against you. But in your sovereign rule, in your sovereign appointment, you have determined, God, to redeem a people to yourself. And you have made us subjects in your kingdom. And so we bow before you. We worship you and serve you reverently. But Lord, we don't serve you only in fear, but we serve you with rejoicing because we know that you are good and gracious. That you have borne the wrath that is due us in yourself.
And so we come to you, Lord. We rest in you. We trust in you. And I pray that that would be an ever-increasing reality in our lives. Amen.